Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Med School Minutes podcast, where we discuss what it takes to attend and successfully complete a medical program. This show is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. Here is your host, Kashik Gua. Hello and welcome to another episode of Med School Minutes where we talk about everything MD related with the focus on international students, specifically Caribbean students. Um, today we have a special guest, Dr. Ronnie Archie, who is an alumnus from St. James School of Medicine. He's currently finishing up his uh, EM residency and is about to start uh, a fellowship at um, WSU in St. Louis. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Dr. Ronnie Archie and uh, let's see what advice he has for uh, current and potential students. Thank you so much, Dr. Archie, for taking the time to uh, and, and talking to us. Uh, why don't you give us a quick background about yourself before we get into any of the questions? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Um, a background about myself is that um, conveniently, I'm actually from the Chicago area. So I grew up uh, born and raised in the city oh, of Chicago, okay. moved to the yeah, moved to the South suburbs. And I was like eight or nine years old. And then that's where um, a good part of my family is now still. Um, so I went there or lived there with the high school out here. Then I went to undergrad at University of Rochester in upstate New York, and then eventually um, went to medical school at St. James um, in Anguilla, Anguilla campus, and then kind of came back to Chicago at that time. My clinicals were all in Chicago. Um, so I finished clinicals here in Chicago, um, ended up doing this very you know weird, unusual path of doing like a, a little burn surgery fellowship before uh, matching into residency. So I did that two years at one of the hospitals we rotated at. Okay. And then from there, I actually got into uh, an emergency medicine program also here in Chicago, South Suburbs, like literally minutes down from my house where I grew up and where I did EMT training as a as a college kid on one summer. And um, I'm in my final year of that right now. Wow. That's, then some, that, that's honestly, next year. That, so uh, fellowship in what? Uh, EMS, Emergency Medical Services and Disaster at uh, WashU in St. Louis, Washington University in St. Louis. Oh, okay. Well, if I'm not mistaken, WashU is one of the most competitive programs, right? Yeah, it's uh, a good, yeah, it's a very good program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's they amazing. Of, and yeah, um, so it almost sounds like a, a, a fairy tale for you where you were in Chicago, you stayed in Chicago, and you managed, like, to consciously stay within like a 20 mile radius of where you grew up. <laughs> yes, That's... absolutely. I did. So that was so not that the plan. Going... It came full circle. <laughs> <laughs> but is that something that you wanted or is that something just happened? To be honest with you, it's something that happened. Um, okay. It's not that I didn't want it. It's in my head. You know, we all have this picture of our lifestyle. And, of course, it's never how you picture it, right? Um, right. But uh, it just so happened in my head. I figured I'd probably go out side of Chicago, I leave home again to go to medical school, which I mean, sorry, to go to residency. Um, not that I was opposed to staying here. It just in my head, that's kind of how I figured it would, it would pan out. Okay. Um, but it just so happened that, you know, it didn't. And there was a, a spot here, which I was happy to happy to land. Right. right. So so was your family super thrilled about it? Or was your family like, oh, my God, three more years to this guy? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're actually super thrilled. <laughs> a little bit of both. Right. No, I'm just no, they were thrilled <laughs> at the time. At the time, it was great because uh, I was uh, staying with my mom's again, okay. so it was good to be home and help her out with stuff and to have that support. But for me, actually, to be honest, I was probably the least thrilled because I did want to leave again to give further away, um, and it's a, a good excuse to live on your own. So my first year of training, I actually stayed yeah. at home, and then my second okay. year when I had back a little bit of money, um, I was able to move out on my own. And I had family help too, but I wanted to get out and live in my own space and right, not be right. at home with the mom anymore. No, I, was no, close, I mean, so I could always go home. We, we, with all due respect to all the parents out there, I'm, I'm, I myself am a parent and I'm sure I'm going to be in that same route. My daughter's only nine, but um, I'm it, family's a, a distraction, like especially when you're doing something as important as surgery. Like, and, and a lot of parents, unless you're physician parents, they don't really get it in the sense that, oh, hey, can you just uh, come and help me with the dishes? And you're like, well, no, I might have to go on call any minute. And and that's something that a lot of uh, non-physicians can't wrap their head around. It's like, well, jobs are typically nine to five. Not You're not on call. Exactly. On-call costs something that yep. and a even, lot of yep, non-physicians. 
Yeah. Same thing. And Even Sony... when studying for step, I was at home and it was the same way. It was like, oh, you're okay. home. Can you like, the plumber's going to be here. Can you let him in? I'm like, yeah, I can. But what if I'm taking a practice test? You have to schedule yeah. around that. So it's great support, but it can be a distraction 100%. Right, right, right. And then I, we've seen this. Uh, like a lot of our students have always said, that, oh, yeah, why don't I go home and study? And our answer to that is always like, well, you know, uh, everybody has a romanticized view of home, right? Because you you think about home when you miss it. You think about home when you're in trouble. But in reality, there's a lot of imperfections with home. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you don't really... And we've seen that uh, firsthand when we went uh, remote for the uh, pandemic. Oh, yeah. We saw a distinct change in students who stayed on the island versus who students who came home to take step one. Uh, I think being disciplined at home is hard. I mm -hmm. mean, and, and I don't know if you agree with me on that, but that's the, that's what the empirical evidence shows that being disciplined at home is hard, but at the same time, as much as you might dislike the class, the classes and the structure that the classes provide help students study better. Um, and, and again, it may not be something that you go into class and you're paying attention to what's in class, but at least that structured study time. And a lot of students do their own thing and a lot of very successful students do their own thing. And so, I and I think it affects your mood. Oh, really? Right? Okay. Yeah, because when, like your, your mindset, I should say, when you're in class and you walk into a class, you're kind of, you've got muscle memory in your brain telling you, hey, I'm here to learn and I'm here to class. Uh, Sometimes at home, uh, it depends on where your study area is. For me, it was in my, my, my desk, in my privacy and my quiet was in my old, you know, right. bedroom growing up. So I've got my desk there, but there's a bed there. So if I look to the left, I'm like, oh, I could take a nap. But, you know, it's different when you're <laughs> in class, you don't have that there, you know. So I got over it and I, you know, I was able to get yeah. through it and set some disciplines, that but there's a lot of extra, I guess, temptation and distractions there. That's very unique. So now that you're going to St. Louis, uh, what's your family stake? St. Louis is really not that far. It's what, a three hour drive from Chicago? It's a six hour, six hours. Six Chicago, hours, yeah, okay. Six, yeah, they're excited. They're so, excited that I'm close enough that they can just surprise visit me, which I was like, okay, that's, that's not the goal of this. <laughs> that's what my dad said. <laughs> that's awesome, you know. But uh, I will say that it's a truly a blessing to have such a close knit family. Uh, For sure. If your parents are still, you know, eager to hang out with you at this age, in my mm -hmm. opinion, that's a, that's a big deal. Yeah, so, that is true, and it's good to be here. It's great after a night shift. You know, it's great to yeah. swing by. I didn't have a Thanksgiving, unfortunately, but I was able to swing by after to grab a bag of food and keep going. Sure. So that, uh, that, yeah, that helps. That's awesome. So, which island were you in originally? So um, I was on the Anguilla in, yeah. campus. Mm -hmm. So you were on the yeah. Anguilla campus. So Anguilla I know was we... newer at the time. Oh, okay. So I know we briefly touched upon what do you think. So, um, so as you know, in our program, we we take make students do the NBME comp before they start their clinicals. Um, and basically, if you don't clear step one, you don't get to go into your clinicals, which I think. As, administrat as an administrator, after talking to a lot of uh, folks in academics, I think that we all agree that that's the best uh, route to take. What What is your view on that? Because a lot of students definitely don't like it. Yeah. So, you know, that's hard. And it's one that I have thought about a little bit over the years because I thought about it from our perspective and... Right. Over my time now, I've met a lot of, of course, you know, U.S. med students where they also are set up the same way where, you know, they right. take, they have their dedicated time to take step one. They bang right. it out in six weeks and keep going. I think ultimately to make my answer, sim my answer simple, simple um, I think I do prefer it before going into clinicals because doing it later, you run into a couple potential problems. Um, okay. One being that you also have to pass step two at some point during the end of clinicals or clinicals to yeah. get into residency, right? So if you go straight and knock it all out and you do basic and clinical, that's great. That's fine. But then you got two exams that you're trying to take before matching the residency. And for some people, yes, I guess maybe that's okay for them because they can if you prepare for the step ahead, like prepare for step two, maybe you're getting that step one stuff in it too. But those are two huge exams. And so doing them back to back, you know, I think 
that just sounds like torture to me. Um, and so really? you run into that if you don't time yourself well. And we're all students or have been students. And I could see that easily, not for all, but for some kind of being a thing that you not put off, but definitely maybe even accidentally actually they put off and you end up doing it too close to step two. And then you've got these two huge exams to take and where are you going to fit that in? And that could kind of right. set you back, I think. I think my second concern for that too would be if you are doing them, if you if you don't need step one to get in the clinicals, um, when you go later to try to, you know, you're probably finishing step two at the end of, again, in the clinicals already, but then you're also doing step one, maybe you wait to the end and you get all your clinicals done and then you do these exams. You may be prolonging your time between your last clinical experience and then your residency start. And there's a couple of different clocks that residency programs use when we're looking at applicants, right? So there's one clock that's like when you start a school and when you graduate it, you know, then there's one clock of when you, you know, started clinicals and when you finished. But there's also a clock between when you finish clinicals and when you start a residency. And that's an important one because as that final time gap grows, if you're putting in time between clinical practice or your clinical um, rotations in med school and residency, if those gaps get bigger and bigger, residencies kind of ask questions like, what have you been doing in that time to stay clinically relevant? It's one thing if you finish in January, let's say, and you start clinicals in July, that's not a lot of time. But if you finished in, you know, June one year, and then you're not starting clinical or starting residency into a year or two years later, they're really going to want to know what you've been doing to keep relevant. And unfortunately, yeah, studying for step, that's great. That's an answer. It's a truth. But they want to see some clinical experience in there, too. So I think that could cause some hiccups by kind of doing. No, those are very, later. very interesting takes. We actually never even uh, thought about looking at give the clock analogy like they're essentially three mm -hmm. separate timelines that residency programs are looking at that's a very interesting way of putting it um and obviously we kind of talked about this that we also feel like the longer you take and if you're not actually in classes we also feel like the level of discipline and the level of uh focus that a student has for this exam tends to go down with time it's not like yeah. you know they're razor focused five years down the road. Um, and not just that, I believe the step two and step one are dramatically different exams. Like the nature of the exams mm -hmm. are very different. So I, you know, clinic, uh, step two is really based on clinical medicine, whereas step one is basic sciences. And I feel like a lot of students have said that if we hadn't done clinicals when we did, we wouldn't actually be able to pass the test because we were doing so many other things that's geared towards step two. So, I mean, yeah. I don't know if you would agree with that or not, because that's what some I would. things that our other think, folks have said. Yeah, if I were to go back and look at some of like the step one material now, even after having been in, this is my, I guess, technically my fifth year of postgraduate training. If I were to go back yeah. and look at some step one stuff, I'd be like, well, like, you know, you know clinically what the picture is, but like, what's the yeah. detail, you know, what's the enzyme that's missing? Because it's stuff that, yes, it's relevant to get to the next level of understanding, but it's not because you don't use it in everyday practice like you use the clinical stuff or not. You don't use it the same way, I say, I should say. Um, it's easy kind of to forget some of that. So kind of have to go back and almost relearn some of the basics or to remember, you know, this is why right. this goes together. That could be challenging. Not that you don't right. use it because it all comes together. Right, but, right. Yeah. right. So um, going back to when you were a student in, in med school, um, it seems like our MD5 or the point where students are taking step one seems to be a, a big milestone, not just for us, but for any medical program in the world. The step one milestone, or I shouldn't say world, but in North America at least, the step one milestone is a big one. Um, and as far as you were concerned, did you change any lifestyle patterns in order to pass the test, the step one? Um, I did. For me, at least, I kind of had to sit out or set aside like my time during the okay. day to like I was. I'm not one that's big, honestly or admittedly. I'm not one that's big on the going. Seven a.m. I'm going to do this, and nine a.m. I'm going to okay. do this, and noon I'm going to do. I know people do recommend that. That's unfortunately that's just not. I mean, I do when I have meetings and appointments. When it comes to studying, that's not right. how I did it. I was more so like, okay, I know I have to study today, and I want to fit in. Let's just say eight hours, right? right. So. I would be flexible, to be honest with you. I would make sure I wanted to get a good night's sleep because I had the ability because I was studying dedicated for steps. So if I happened to wake up at 
seven and I was able to start my studying at nine, that's great. But if something happened, I was like, oh my God, you know, my dog got into the mud. I've got to like bathe my dog now and I'm an hour behind. I was like, right. okay, if my studying starts an hour late at 10, I'm still going to go at eight hours, whatever time it is. So six o'clock or maybe seven o'clock if I take an hour lunch break. So um, for me, I had, I had to change my patterns and kind of just like some of the extra stuff that I would maybe do. Like, oh, a friend texts me and says, hey, let's grab dinner tonight. It's like, no, I can't because I got to block off this time. But like, you know, if you're okay. up for a late dinner at nine o'clock and I'm done with studying, that's fine. Or, hey, I know Saturday I'm going to do a half day already because that's kind of, you know, what I gave myself for Saturday or Sunday. Let's plan it for Saturday night or family engagement. Let's plan it for Sunday night because I know, you know, I'll be done studying by three o'clock that day, you know. So for me, I kind of had to change kind of my, I guess, like social life and it's kind of how I looked at my schedule throughout the week because like, I was kind of making my quote unquote nine to five job studying and I would try to fit everything else around that. Right. Wow. That's, uh, and, and, and how often did it happen that someone's messaging you or calling you, Hey, let's hang out. And you've had to turn oh that my God. out all the time, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I had so many talks with my dad about this and like, oh my God, I feel like I'm missing out on life and doing that. And he would give me stories about when he was in college studying for for um, his CPA exam and things like that. And he's okay. like, you know how many parties I missed and, you know, your cousins, you know, Jeff and, you know, his cousins, we got a huge family on his side. He's like, you know yeah. how many times they dogged me for missing a party or missing this? And he was like, let me tell you. He's like, you're going to miss some parties. He's like, but when it comes down and you're done with it too, you're not going to remember the parties and the things that you miss. And that moment you're feeling like you're missing out, but it's going to all be okay. You know, like yeah. you're, it will be fine. You know, the small dinner or the small party, you know, stuff like that. It's fine. So, but all the time, distractions left and right. Hey, let's grab lunch. Hey, let's go here. Hey, let's do that. You know, it was just never ending like grenades everywhere. And sometimes I would fall for, sometimes I would do it. You know, sometimes they're like, you know what? I'm tired. My mind is like, whoosh. And at the right, end of the, right, my right. mom and my dad, they're like, you know what? Go take an hour off. Go to the movie with your friends. Like you've been studying yeah. outside for 10 days. And so sometimes I, I would, I would do that. Yeah. Um, I just would try not to make it an everyday habit. And then when my right. friend got me into like going to the gym, I would actually build that right. into my schedule because I felt that was actually helpful. So every night I okay. knew at seven o'clock, he wanted to go to the gym. So whether I was done studying or not, I would make myself stop. I would go to the gym for that 60 to 90 minutes, maybe grab a quick bite afterwards. And I would go back and finish up my last hour of studying if I hadn't oh. finished early enough to do it. So. Yeah, but there's wow. always distractions. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that brings us to a very interesting point. I mean, we were talking in another podcast about um, mental health and especially the uh, stresses of the step one. The step one, I believe, is one of the hardest exams in the world. From my understanding, I think it's been rated as one of the high, uh, hardest exams in the world. Uh, definitely the top three, if not the hardest. Um you know, you mentioned that you did take some breaks and went out with friends. Like, how important would you say that aspect is? And, and how do you draw a line as to what what is too much R&R versus too much studying? How do you know when you're tilting to one or the other side of things? Yeah, that's a very good question and good point. Um, I think... My initial instinct, the default answer, it is different from person, excuse me, <clears throat> it's different from person to person, um, what's too much. I think we all have different kind of like social needs or different kind of like, you know, setups and friends and things like that. So we all may have like a different, you know, level of kind of like distractions around this. But I think generally speaking, once you kind of get into your step one routine, you kind of know what you should and shouldn't be doing, right? I know I had those days where like, I finished a day and I was like, man, I probably got in two hours of studying. And I was like, I know that that was not enough. Like I just knew, you know, I knew I had a plan to finish, you know, this practice test and then review right. it. But for whatever reason, I, it was a day of distraction. And I was like, man, I didn't. So I knew that was too little. So in my head, I was like, okay, I can't do this every day. It's fine. I did it today. I needed a mental break. That's fine. But then I would kind of have to reset and think, okay, tomorrow, what's my goal? You know, how many hours do I want to give? And so I think that's kind of how I had to go about it. I think um, it is very, very, very important to allow yourself to have those distractions sometimes, whether it's friend or whether it's like other stuff. I, at the time, had a dog and I would look forward to like my breaks where he was like panting on my lap. Like, I got to go pee. I got to go pee, you know? So I would break um, and take like 30 to 60 minute time um, okay 36 minute breaks to go walk him and i think that was just important for mental health some days if it was like winter and we weren't going to go on a long walk i actually 
told myself there was a TV show back in the day called Prison Break, and I was rewatching it because I never watched it. <laughs> so I would give myself um, most days of the weekday, at least four or five days, I would give myself an hour because it was playing on TV show, like two, yeah. it was playing on TV, on a TV network. I would give myself an hour to watch that show because, <clears throat> excuse me, it was my hour break of the day. And I remember being okay. excited, like, oh, three or four o'clock comes in the afternoon. That's my break time. I would do it. I would make myself a cup of coffee. I would drink it during that hour. And then that's like my break to like not think about it. And then after that, I would like, you know, you know, go back to studying or review the questions that I had done before that. So I think it's very important to allow yourself those things. I think it's important also to like be forgiving to yourself. Everyone thinks right. that you've got to be super disciplined and only do this and only do this. But you have to allow yourself the time for the coffee breaks, the TV breaks, the, the friend breaks. I think the balance just comes personally for each person. And if you're doing more studying than the other stuff, then I think that you're you're doing the right thing. Because at that point, the way my parents okay. come out is my particularly my dad, he always said, like, you know, when I was in college, like, you know, that's your full time job, you know, when you're in right. college, you know, so my Absolutely. job is to, his thing he's paying for. That's fine. So my yeah. job is to study. So I had that same mentality in studying in med school. No, that's perfect. So um, essentially, so you said that if you feel like you're studying more than you're socializing, that's <laughs> probably a good mix then that but that's yes. important yeah, at though. least. At the very least, so, yeah, that's, I think it's important to have that, yeah. Okay. To know that. So, I mean, so essentially someone saying, oh, you know what, I'm just, you know, studying so much more than I'm socializing. I'm going to cut back on studying. <laughs> that's probably not the right approach. That's probably not exactly. Like. Yeah. I don't mean it like that. Yeah. But just like for <laughs> right. me, and it's hard to give a number because like some people say, no, like, know. you know, we, it, we people, people say, oh, you need to be studying eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. Um, I think it varies for people to people. It depends on how effective you are at studying. I had some days where I had a very effective study section session and I studied five or six hours that day. I had okay. some days where I was studying for 10 hours and I felt like I didn't make it through anything. So it depends on how tired you are, how brain fatigued you are, what else right. is going on, how focused you are. So I think it can vary. So I hate right. giving like a number, a number. No, no, I think that that's fair. But essentially it sounds like you have to be tired of studying that's when you kind of know that you studied <laughs> enough and exactly, then at that exactly. point when you're tired it makes sense to go out and take a break like walking mm -hmm. a dog go out for a coffee or yep. go hit the gym or what have you but i mm -hmm. think that that 100%. uh study fatigue is the is is the constant or, or the most predominant feeling during that period yes, of time that is true <laughs> to know like okay like i got a full day and yeah 100 percent. yes that's at least in awesome. my opinion i would say <laughs> that's that's amazing so when you finish step one obviously you get through the hurdle um how short-lived is that euphoria of passing that exam step one oh uh how short-lived probably that's a good question i gotta think Probably, I would say for me, a few weeks, maybe a couple months, I would say. I can't okay, remember. Well, God, it's been a minute. Um, I mean, the euphoria in the moment is like days, right? It's like, it's right. like, or hours. Right. Like, I remember my mom and I were jumping up and down and like, oh, I get it. Like, <laughs> I'm actually going to be a doctor, you know? So like, there's a small <laughs> chance you won't. But then for me, you know, I went in, um, oh, wait, I was thinking step two. Yeah. So step one, I went in, then I started clinicals right up. So then, yeah, you start writing clinicals and then it's like, the world is like hits you again. It's like, okay, now I've got two years of clinicals and I'm going to have step two soon. So like, yeah, you passed right. it, but guess what? There's another hurdle coming. So it really depends on how close after passing you get in the clinicals. So, and I think right. for me, it was six weeks to eight, yeah, it took two months. So for me that euphoria probably lasted a decent, like two months ago, like, oh, I passed, I passed, oh. I'm starting clinicals. Once I started clinicals, I'm like, okay, well, I'm excited for that. But now there's a new light at the end of the tunnel or a new right, hurdle right. at the end of the tunnel. And that's the second step. So at the time wow. it was CS and CK, but. Right. So now it's like a complete gear shift altogether. And you've got, and, and as we discussed earlier, the material in CK is completely different or step two is completely different from step one. So it's like trying to gather all this information all over again. But, uh, but typically, I mean, we're very proud to see that our um, students who pass step one uh, with probably with uh, over a 99% certainty are passing step uh, two as well. However, uh, there is, like, especially in the last year, uh, post-pandemic, we've noticed that students are taking a little bit longer to clear that step two test. So uh, now that you are, like, in your final year residency, are there any uh, words or any... Uh, rumors in the grapevine find that, hey, the step two actually has become harder or, you know, the step two, the focus has completely changed. What have you really heard about step two? 
you know, to be completely honest, I was thinking about that as you were saying it. It's kind of funny. Like once you're out of it, it's I feel like I don't hear much about the grapevine okay. of, about the extra actual test with the exception of like I work up very closely with med students as part of my right. my role for this year. And so we talk about the test. But, you know, I honestly can't think of a conversation I've had that has kind of given me any like inkling or word around the grapevine, so to speak, about like if it's become harder or, or different. I do know there was some concern or worry that it'd be harder now that step one was pass fail. But I honestly haven't heard much feedback. But now that you said it, I'm going to ask my you know my med students when I see them next because okay. I'm kind of curious. But I haven't That's heard awesome. much much around grapevine at all about you know now if it seems harder or if it seems like different material. It seems very similar because when I was studying for step three, I was reading up on some blogs and talking to some people about it, and it seems like right. you know similar to kind of step two how it was. So I, th- I would guess it hasn't changed much, but maybe it is a bit harder or tougher. That's okay, a great so well, but that's good to know that. Because, you know, every every group that goes through the exam, they say that they always say that, you know, my exam was harder than almost any other yeah. previous mm-hmm. exam. So it would be very interesting to know and see what you find out from your uh, sources as to you know, whether the test has changed. I do know for a fact that now that step two has the only uh, score, the score mm-hmm. for step two has become so much more relevant for uh, programs because mm-hmm. step one doesn't really have a score. Step two does. And a lot of programs are truly focusing on step two with, um, for example, before step two extra attempts were potentially forgiven uh, mm-hmm. with very good scores. I think that that's kind of changed a little bit where step one, as long as you pass, they're okay. But step two, multiple I attempts because you get an actual score, right? So, and yeah. your second, your, your second attempt, if it's not, very high or just passing it could potentially be a red flag for you that's what program directors have told us but at Mm -hmm. the same time you know there are so many exceptions to that as well so that's true yeah so i definitely yeah go ahead sorry oh no sorry no i I can speak on it too like because when we are um when we are i'm part of the you know I'm, i'm recruitment uh and medical student chair for this year right so when we're doing our applications and our, our, our interviews and looking at applications, we are trying to get a holistic approach that is correct. Um, but you are right, you know, that there potentially are some, I'll say flags, I won't say full hurdle or full barriers, but there are some flags, you know, if you're seeing a repeat on some things too, it's the thing that makes you at the very least go, hmm, okay. Sometimes it's a, hmm, okay, but everything else is great. And so we're still interviewing and we're still ranking these people high and you're still looking at them. Um, obviously it's up to the potential Put, uh, program it's up to the program directors and the actual faculty to decide kind of what exactly their standards are. Um, but yes, you're right. Programs are different. Some may have higher standards than others when it comes to like they have like a strict cutoff for this or strict no retakes. But that's not every program. And so we are. You, you you're right that it could definitely be a hurdle, a retake. Um, but hopefully, it doesn't discourage people to applying from applying to where they want because my gut off the hip advice is apply where you're going to apply and what will happen will happen, right? I don't want people to cut themselves off from the beginning um, because you never know. You never know what else they look at and what else might be great in your application versus someone else's or vice versa. Right, right. That That's, that's very good advice. Um, so one thing I did want to talk to you about is obviously you chose to go into EM. Um, mm-hmm. And I know EM maybe about five years ago was one of the hottest and hardest to get into residencies. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of a sudden, post-pandemic, last year in particular, not, not uh, yeah, last year, like thousands of EM positions went unfilled, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Is that like true? Are those rumors? Is that is that something you mm-hmm. actually noticed? What was your experience like? Why do you think that that happened? Does it have something to do with the pandemic? Yeah, you know, uh, yes, <laughs> the answer to all of that. Yeah, um, no, I think it's it was multifactorial. I think so. It is true. You know, there were tons of spots. I forget. I, at one point, I knew the exact number, but you were correct. It was a, it was a large number of spots that went unfilled, um, and it's it was a weird kind of unexpected thing, but I knew from my program and other programs and speaking to other programs in Chicago and other people and other programs, like, you know, it was felt across the country, you know, there's people who had spots, there was programs who were quote unquote, high ranking programs who may have had spots you wouldn't expect it. There were other programs who you 
you know, when the you known had spots, it, it was everywhere, right? So it didn't affect every program, but it affected a lot of them. Um, I think it probably had something to do with a couple of things. One, the pandemic, um, not only of less, expo one thing being less exposure to EM during the pandemic, because a lot of places had virtual rotations and for ER, other rotations too, like surgery and things, but it's really hard to get a virtual experience in, you know, ER and in surgery or in certain things. I'm not saying that um, virtual medicine works for certain than others. I mean, medicine, as we know, you need to be face to face, but some things uh, it's, it's easier to do virtually than others. And so one, I think students got less exposure. So a lot of them, I was, I'm surprised to know even now that students who don't get EM exposure until the second half of their fourth year and they make a switch later or second half of their third year, or even beginning of fourth year, and they make a switch at, um, the, the last minute, you know, because a lot of schools still don't require a core EM. So some people don't even know what EM is. So if you're going through that, you have that at baseline, but then going through the pandemic and you're getting even less exposure, then you're probably going to have a less interest in EM just from that. Two, I think those who maybe did have exposure to EM during the pandemic, it might have been a very grueling or overwhelming experience depending, depending on where you were in the country. You know, COVID was rampant in the ED. Um, EDs looked different all across the country, but one thing that was pretty common was that they were slammed and it was not always the best um, ideal environment, not because, you know, of the people, but just because it was just, I mean, not because of the people you work with, but because it was just a very tough and grueling time getting through COVID, seeing people that sick, seeing people dying when previously you wouldn't expect them to die. There was just so much things to go, so many things working um, against you during that time that I think that that may also have made a uh, um, an impact on how many people went into EM. And then I think there were other things that happened that year too um, that may have, for whatever reason, good or bad, you know, put some negative spotlight on EM. Um, and then I think altogether they kind of created a, a multifactorial effect that caused, you know, less entrance and less applications into EM that year. And we saw a drop in the number of, of, of applicants, but also in a number of spots that were filled. That's my I own. See opinion of it. I said, no, I mean, I think that that's a very fair point. So you're essentially saying is that because of the pandemic, the general number of applications went down because people couldn't experience EM in all its quote unquote true glory, mm -hmm. so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Even and the people who loved EM, they only got one experience, if that, you know. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. You know, I, we never even thought about that. We, we, we were just told, oh, yeah, most people are just too lazy to want to apply for the grueling rigors of, <laughs> of EM. So, but that <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Most people didn't even realize what it was. Uh, for, fortunately for us, so we have a mandatory, uh, it's still an elective rotation, but it's a mandatory rotation. You have to mm -hmm. take it at the end of third year for us. Uh, that's okay. a new thing. So, okay. um for us, there our EM rotations were all in person. Our preceptors very clearly said that, we, yeah, yeah, we can't do an EM over virtually. That's yeah. just not going to happen. So, right. uh, so I do think that that, and which is interesting because a lot many more of our students actually applied to EM last year um, because, really. yeah, because they were like, oh wow, this is really cool because. Our mandatory EM rotation started, what, about three years ago? And since then, we've seen mm -hmm. a distinct uptick in the number of EM applications and more and more students matching into EM. Oh, um, good. That's good. So, uh, I feel when like you... when... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I feel like when I was going through, there was a couple of us I remember being interested in EM, but it was hard to get EM rotation. So even students, so I remember thinking students who would score better or not score better, who would um, uh, what's it, have more more likely chance, uh, whether it be scores or whatever, to get the EM than me. I remember some of them being deciding not to do EM last minute. And I was like, no, do it. Like, I want you to be an example for me, you know, because the exposure we had or I'll just do IM or FM. And I know, so I was happy that, you know, I still went my route and did it, but I'm glad to hear now that, you know, people are, are getting excited about that we have an actual EM rotation, at least one for everyone so that you can at least get the experience yes. and hopefully be encouraged to pursue it if that's what you want to pursue. Yes. Yeah, and we encourage them to do it at the end of third year. Once they're done with mm -hmm. all their cores, we actually encourage the EM rotation to be done. All the hospitals that we're at now have, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, they're actually all uh, level one trauma centers. They all have oh, level good. one trauma centers awesome. associated with them. So we have a very robust EM exposure now. 
Yeah. And I think it's so, helpful because if you know this, when you're taking all the tests, step one, step two, step three, and even some boards, well, obviously my boards, but um, every time you see a question, it's either a patient presents to the ED, that's how it starts, or a patient seen in an office. But an overwhelming majority are always if they present to the ED because that's just like the best way to get an undifferentiated patient. It doesn't mean that they're all ED questions, but if you see a question stem, that's what they are. That's what, So I think it's good to, at least as a med student, to get that foundation and kind of see what the ED is like, even for yeah, one yeah. rotation. I got you. That's, that's very interesting. Um, and uh, as far as, as a profession, uh, emergency medicine, uh, a lot of people say this, that it's one of the most traumatic professions within the realm of other specialties, because you're the first line of fire you're seeing the grisliest, goriest, and, and the toughest cases. Uh, and your job is to essentially stabilize the patient until a specialist can come in. Um, what is your take on that? Now that you're actually in the profession, you've done this for five years, would you think that that is an accurate characterization? Or are there any redeeming qualities of being a, an EM physician? Or is it just completely thankless where... You're just going seeing just a lot of trauma. What, what are your What's your take on? <laughs> um, I think you can get a mix of all of it. You know, I think to be fair, my last three years were the only ones at EM. My first two were doing burn surgery, so I had a different you know experience. Even though I was going into EM for a specific burn consults, my these last three years, so this third year now has been the ones I've been spending fully in the ED. And I think it's a mix of all that. I think that you're absolutely right. Is that you're seeing. The, not even the grisliest, I'll just say the sickest because it's not also, it's not just trauma, but it's trauma and medicine. Some of the sickest patients that I've seen are actually the non, non-traumas, right? Sometimes the trauma sounds bad and it comes in and, oh, this person is not that bad. After all, they got a break here, some scratches here, it just looks bad. But to someone who comes in fluid heart failure and massive pulmonary edema and they can't breathe and so they're drowning on their own secretions, they're sicker sometimes than that trauma patient that comes in, right? So you see a gamut of, of different uh, types of presentations, but I would say I think that for ER it's hard because at the very beginning of any patient encounter, they're usually undifferentiated, right? So the undifferentiated, undifferentiated patient is the patient that you don't know what's wrong with them. You know, I don't have the pleasure of knowing that this patient is seeing me. Sometimes I do, but I can't say that this patient is seeing me for their wound or this patient is seeing me for follow-up to their gallbladder surgery, or this patient is seeing me to manage their blood pressure medicines, right? They come in, they have a really bad cough and they're short of breath, and I've got to start figuring out what's wrong with them. And there could be 20 different things that's wrong with them. So I think that makes ER tough. And I think that sometimes um, that's hard and people don't always see it like that if you're not in EM. You know, that can be a tough thing, but you know, our specialty, our specialty is in, figuring out that undifferentiated patient and being out, figuring out what's going on with them and to get them to their next place. So sometimes it's stabilizing only and shipping them out or sending them to wherever. And sometimes it's stabilizing and starting treatment. So you have to know a lot of stuff. I might not know things in, as nitty gritty as a cardiologist would, obviously, who is treating his, you know, follow-up patients about all the diseases, but I definitely have to know enough to know, are they having a heart attack or not? Is this heart failure? Is this some type of heart block? I have to know those things enough to start their treatment in my ER until they can get seen by another specialist, whether it's on the floor or in the ICU or at outpatient clinic. So um, you, you do see that. And sometimes, honestly, sometimes it is thankless, um, but that's why we do it, right? Sometimes, I mean, patients are for the most part, thankful and, and families are as well when you're helping them. But um, people are people and the emotions get the best of us. And sometimes they're sick and scared and that's why they are the way they are. But sometimes they're sick and scared and still thankful. It just depends. And so it can be thankless from that perspective. And unfortunately, um, it can be thankless from um, a colleague perspective, right? I have to admit every patient I have, I've got to call the internal medicine team or the critical care ICU team or the surgery team or whatever. And, you know, no matter what you're doing, whenever you're calling, yes, I'm asking for help, but I'm giving someone else work to do. And no one likes to be given work, period, right? Um, so there's already, you're already primed for people to be a little bit annoyed at you because I'm calling you to do something, right? And I get it. I spent two years being the consultant and burning. I would answer the phone like, oh, 
in my head, I'm like, you got another conflict for me, but that's my job, right? So, but we're fighting against that all the time. So a lot of times the ER kind of can be kind of like the, what do they call it? The, um, the redheaded stepchild where like, no matter what we can't do well for anyone because we're giving someone work or we didn't do this right. But really it is a very challenging, but also rewarding field because like you really got to start from uh, ground zero a lot of times even okay. with patients histories i can't be blinded and i have to kind of think of the big right, picture so right, right, yes right. it is busy yes you see a lot of sick people yes it can be thankful so all the stuff you said but it all comes together and so you got pros right. and cons of it so let me ask you a very mm -hmm. like a connected question what makes uh you get up every morning to do what you do why do you do it why do I do? I think coming off what we just said, even though it can be thankful, I mean, thankless, <laughs> um, I think I do it because for a couple of reasons. One, um, I feel like for my personality, I want to be someone who's there for others, you know, when I can, right. you know, obviously we can't do everything, right. but in my own, what I have realm of control over in my own life, you know, um, I want to be able to help those in need when they're, when they're sick. And I think for me, um, what gets me up and going is because even though the job is challenging um, and tough, it's also rewarding and it kind of feeds my needs as a person. And my, those would be kind of, I need social interaction. Um, I'm a social person. I work well with people. So I like that because I can use it to help me in my field and work with my colleagues, but it also helps me re relate to my patients because lots of times they're in the most stressful situation that they've ever be been in. And that helps me, you know, mm -hmm. um, having those kind of tools. And so for me, getting up and being able to do that and say, Hey, um, even though you're sick or even though I've got bad news to break, at least I can be there in some way, shape, form or fashion for someone. So for me, kind of having that that kind of reward of feeling like I've helped someone, um, but also kind of getting my needs met of like having like a fast paced something that keeps me excited. It keeps me from getting bored, right? It keeps me um, on my toes. Um, I like to kind of, you know, continue to, to kind of push myself and kind of learn from other things and kind of just be able to kind of continue to grow. And I think for me, I kind of knew I didn't want to do something where um, I wasn't kind of moving fast or what I say, kind of uh, sitting behind a desk, you know, for me, like right. that's why I was drawn to medicine in the first place. And for me in the ER, I'm always on my feet. I'm always moving. Yes, I have to sit behind a desk and document because we all have to do that. But, you know, I'm able to like, you know, feed the, the ADD in me and kind of like satisfy that, but also work with people. And it just, it allows me to kind of get up and make me feel like I'm actually, makes me feel like I'm actually doing a difference. And I think, and or making a difference, I should say, in the lives of others, even for people who have minor injuries, the same as those who have major injuries. And I think that's what keeps right. me going day to day. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so obviously... Uh, you came from a Caribbean medical school, St. James. Did you ever feel like there was any prejudice in your career because you were from a Caribbean medical student? No, which is funny. I was just talking to another resident about this recently, also okay. from a Caribbean school. And then I was talking to a faculty member when I was applying for fellowship who I looked on his wall and I saw his Caribbean diploma. Oh, and wow. I was like, wow, there are, there are more of us than I realized, you know? Um, yeah. So overall, no, I, I may be forgetting one or two blips that really didn't register with me over the years, but overwhelmingly I can say mostly, no, I didn't. There's conversations okay. where people have asked where you've gone to school. And I personally have been like, I went to St. James and I had kind of like, I was ready. I was on the ready to kind of be right. like, why are they asking, you know, or to be defensive, right. but it was, it, I never had anyone ever who was like, oh, do they kind of turn okay. the nose to it? You went to a Caribbean school and, oh, or lots of, actually it's usually the opposite. Like, oh, wow, that must've been amazing. Or, um, what chose you to go there? Or like, gosh, you probably okay. enjoyed the weather or stuff like that. You know, yeah. I had students okay. when I was in Bern telling me, I had people who say, who came from other Caribbean schools. And when I said that, they're like, oh, I'm surprised. And I was like, well, what do you mean? They're like, oh, I had a guess you come from a, a US med school. And I really didn't know what that meant. And I was kind of okay. like, okay. And again, they didn't mean it to be offensive. They meant it to be like, a, so that's what I remember. They meant it to be a compliment, but it made me think like, oh, you know, we're getting the same education. You know, we're, yeah. we're learning what we need to learn and we're performing in our fields. And you can't look at someone and tell you, right, you get right. the background. It's only when they ask you or it comes up that you, you find out. Right. So you mentioned that you went through, this is the second fellowship that you're going to uh, start. Um, mm -hmm. But the you EMS, had yeah. one even before you matched. 
Uh, mm-hmm. uh, what what fellowship was that? Is that something that you would recommend other students to do? To yeah. take that route and probably potentially delay your residency by two years or so? Does that yeah. is that a yeah. what what what's your take on that? Yeah, I will say it's not a common thing. I will say um, I kind of paid my own way in that regard, but it's something that I absolutely um, would say it recommend it for the person if it fits you. Right for me, we had a burn surgery rotation at a hospital here in Chicago that was an elective that we were that was offered to us as students when I was going through St. James. And so I did that rotation and I loved it. And it just so happened, I already knew I was going to be off cycle, right, for the match. Because, you know, sometimes we graduate in May, sometimes January, depends on when you start it. I already knew I was going to be off cycle. I would have at least like, I'm going to round and say nine to 12 months to fill. Um, so I knew I had to find something for those that time, as I was talking before about, you know, making sure I stay clinically relevant when you're kind of apply. And it just so happened that on that rotation, on that service, my attending or the, the burn unit director happened to have his own established fellowship, non-ACGME fellowship, really just a fellowship that he created for the hospital that really allowed for him to get extra help on his service. But it also helps people who are in any type of year of transitions. And going through that, when I first found out about that, I didn't even know that it existed when I did that rotation. It just so happened I was in the right spot at the right time and happened to do well on that rotation. So it was offered to me. But then going through these last few years, I've come across people in conversation and things there are other similar types of fellowships that are created at other institutions across the country too. I've heard of some being in cardiology. I've heard of some being in neurosurgery. I've heard of some being in surgery specialties. And really, um, when you think of it like this way, it's a non-ACGM fe- non-ACGME fellowship. And really, it's something that's created to kind of create more help for whatever service that needs help, but also provide people with extra training. So for me, for example, it could be me rotating or transitioning between med school and residency but needing to fill a gap of time. It could be some people, maybe they're switching fields or switching specialties and they need to find a spot because they're no longer in a program. Maybe it's someone who has done a transitional year or two and they're waiting to get picked up to go to a spot and they need to fill the time. So it's at some place where someone's in the amount of transition. And really um, it's called a fellowship because that's kind of, you, you can't create a residency spot, you know, non ACGME, there's a lot of hoops and stuff. So when the hospital or the unit or the director says, hey, I need extra help. I want someone who's actually got an MD and that I can teach and they have a license to practice under. You can say, hey, I'm going to call it a fellowship. They can be my fellow to help. I train them and teach them directly. No, it's not through the ACG and me where, you know, it'll, um, it's not the same as someone doing like my fellowship I'm going into now. There's no boards for it, but it certainly counts as clinical experience. I have a certificate that said I did my, you know, surgical critical care and all that, but it's not the same as someone who's doing a critical care uh, trauma fellowship after a full five year surgery residency. It's different in that regard. So I want to be clear about that. But it's definitely something I would recommend if someone is looking for something to do to fill time. Not to fill time. That sounds bad. But just because let's say they need they want to stay clinically re- relevant. They're not going into residency yet. Um, they have, you know, a year off, let's say they I want to work, I want to learn. For me, it was a great time. I was able to work with um, the residents that rotate through burn, which were EM resident first year uh, residents, there were surgery second year residents, and there was other things. So it was able to help me. I wanted to go into EM, so it was very relevant. And so um, doing that, I would recommend it if it's someone who, you know, the, the, the category, you fit in that category. But if you're someone that's finishing, you know, med school and, you know, June, wherever you may when you graduate and, you know, you're applying for a match and you're going to match in July, then no, you know, I would say delay your your time just to do that. But for me, I wanted to stay clinically relevant. I didn't just want to, you know, scribe for a doctor's office or maybe shadow a physician for you. I wanted to actually work and get, and also get paid, you know, but at least right, work right. and get the clinical experience. So I, awesome. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm glad I took that route. Awesome. Wow. That's great. Uh, just so our students know, uh, if you get into a fellowship pre-residency, are the pays competitive to residency residents or is that, do they pay you dramatically less than residents? Generally speaking, yes. Where I would now, it could be different from institution to institution, but where I was, um, I got paid on their, everyone, residents across the country get paid on a PGY scale. So postgraduate okay, year. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So as an example, just to share um, myself and other people in my fellowship um, at that hospital, you know, we started, my first year was one and then two and then three, you get paid. Um, when I, when I came to EM, I started at PGY one again, because I, you know, left the hospital and I'm doing an actual ACGME, res ACGME residency, but mm -hmm. I have a colleague who was in the burn surgery route, he actually ended up matching in the family. But when he started in family medicine, he was a first year resident. He was an intern, none of that time counted, but he got paid as a PGY4 because he was already uh -huh. in that same hospital symptom right. and heat system and he was rising up the pay scale. So because right. that makes sense. So you get paid yeah. according to your year. Perfect. That's good to know. So yeah. uh, Dr. Archie, before we let you go, is there any words of advice for other St. James students or other Caribbean students that you would have? and you wish or that you somebody had told you when you were a student yeah i think there was i think my the first thing advice wise i would say is to not undersell yourself um uh, and i was just talking to another resident about this coming from my program different specialty but she's going into her first attending job next year you know graduating at the same time and really just kind of don't don't undersell or underestimate yourself because a lot of times I think we have our own stigmas about you're asking about have I you know had any issues of being a Caribbean student I haven't and I think the most issues we have are kind of coming from within ourselves. we think am I good enough you know we already have you know the whole um, imposter syndrome you know finishing residency in med school but I think that we have this kind of stigma like oh I might not be able to make this program because I was only a uh, this student, or I only did that. You got to get that out of your head. You know, for me, like we go through the the same steps, the same test, and we get through, we get our degree. Really, you're only limited by what you want to do. It's not your school, right? So I would say, if you want to apply for this specialty, go for it. If you want to apply for whatever fellowship, go for it. Everyone, U.S. and graduate or IMGs included, may have to make alterations because you know things don't work out. But it's that's just you know it's life. But because you are a Caribbean student, I wouldn't want someone to think, oh, I can't do that. And that just want to set the bar lower before that. Keep striving, go for your goals. And then when you're interviewing, just be yourself. Be yourself and ask questions. You know, those are my things. As someone who has interviewed over the last two, this is the third year now, interviewed other students coming into medicine. We like people who are themselves, people who can talk about their favorite meal or their favorite band, or they have a couple questions about that program. And it show, they've shown that they've done some research and they know us and they are they want to know more. So I would say be yourself, you know, keep striving and kind of don't sell yourself short. In terms of stuff I wish I had known, um, probably I guess what I just said, you know, just known, just, you know, like that I can, I can do whatever it is I want to do on par with any U.S. student or others. So you kind of just don't give up and like you are your own best advocate. So you got to sell for, you got to sell yourself and you got to kind of like, you know, um, keep yourself uplifted. Thank you so much for those valuable insights, Dr. Archie. Really appreciated um, your your take on a lot of these different topics and especially um, why you do what you do. That was very interesting to us. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time and the advice that you've given for uh, potential students as well as current students. And if you or anyone, if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, feel free to download uh, our other episodes at Med School Minutes. Um, again, if you liked the content, give us a like and a follow. This goes a long way for me and my production team uh, in creating this sort of content. And we really do hope that you find this helpful. Uh, do get the other episodes uh, anywhere you get your favorite podcasts, including uh, Spotify, YouTube, Google. And uh, again, Remember, there's no shortcut to becoming an MD. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning into our show. We hope you enjoyed another episode of Med School Minutes. If you like our content, please follow us and receive notification when a new show is posted. This podcast is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. For a video version of this podcast, please check us out on sjsm.org video.